Welcome, welcome to the show, everybody. This is your Communist Radio Hour. I haven't said that in a while. But uh, yeah, we're here with a special bonus episode. Bonus, 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 bonus. 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 Okay, so we are discussing an essay by Aaron Beninav and John Clegg, both members of the EndNotes Collective. It's called Crisis and Immiseration, colon, Critical Theory Today. And it appeared in the Sage Handbook of Frankfurt School of Critical Theory. Um, yeah, so really revisiting a lot of familiar territory. If I had known that it was as, a, you know, um, if, if it kind of like drew upon all of these same ideas, then I probably would have selected something else for us to read. But, uh, you know, whatever. There, there's some good points in it, especially in the conclusion and a few um, clarifications along the way that I thought were quite interesting. But very much uh, like saying, you know, a lot of things that readers of EndNotes, listeners to the show will be familiar with, basically talking about um, crisis and misery, meaning the um, sloughing off of workers from the capitalist production process and the creation of surplus populations and, um, you know, the surface economy, and the lack of the workers' identity of a, of a coherent unity that people in society can organize around in order to overcome capitalism, et cetera, et cetera. All ideas that we are, that we are all very familiar with at this point. But, uh, you know, still, regardless, pretty good essay, I thought. I mean, pretty, pretty decent essay. Um, I thought there are, there are a few, uh, just like points, a few turns of phrases, a few, um, moments in which they articulated a few ideas, um, you know, that we've, that we've heard before about like workers identity and unity and separation, for example, but which seemed to, uh, you know, clarify them a little bit for me. Maybe, maybe it was like the particular word choice, but maybe it's also just the, the repetition is finally, causing it to sink in. But um, yeah, Owen, what did you think of this essay? Yeah, I agree with pretty much everything you just said. Like, it is kind of retreading familiar ground, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think for these sort of like complex historical analyses and like breakdowns of the development of various theories, like it's usually at least for me, maybe other people learn things differently, but I find that I get a lot from like reading basically the same information from like a number of sources written in slightly different ways and kind of like viewing essentially the same phenomenon from different angles. I find I get a lot out of that. So like, you know, we're revisiting a lot of themes here, like particularly about how at mid-century, like, you know, capitalism seemed to be really on the upswing in the 1950s and the 1960s, like after the war in the United States in particular, there was this growing middle class and like a lot of what Marx had predicted didn't seem to be coming out true quite the way he had predicted, if at all. So people who were of an anti-capitalist persuasion, like say the Frankfurt School, had to develop new theories to address that. So like this is this is ground that we've seen covered before, but I did find it useful to see it like kind of like examined from a slightly different angle. Yeah, and there are a few. I I really think that the conclusion in particular was a uh, pretty interesting. They kind of like summarize with um, three different points about what the purpose of theory is or how to. Um, you know, think about theory specifically in a communist uh, sense. And I thought those were pretty interesting points and could have been elaborated on. Like I, they kind of came at the end and kind of suggested like, um, you know, further elaboration that did not come in this essay. So hopefully, I don't know if that will happen in EndNotes 5, or if maybe I'll find like another essay that they elaborated on. 
Um, but yeah, this essay, I think it was published in 2014, I believe. So it's like pretty much at the same time as EndNotes 4. Uh, it's coming around the same time. But um, yeah, so before we get into those concluding points, um, the essay is kind of framed around the Frankfurt School, because again, it's coming in a collection of uh, essays about the Frankfurt School. And this one is pretty, it's not entirely, it's, it's a bit irreverent. Like they don't actually spend that much time talking about the Frankfurt School or critical theory. They kind of like take it on as a starting point, but then from there, um, really use it as an occasion to uh, develop their own ideas, their own more communist, communizer ideas about what theory is and about what um, capitalism is, etc. Without really, like they're certainly not doing like a deep dive into any Adorno texts or they're not doing any ex exegesis of any real Frankfurt school theorists, they're just kind of like uh, referencing it a little bit. And then in the conclusion, they're kind of like talking about a little bit about what makes critical theory as it was developed by these Frankfurt schoolers um, a bit inadequate. And uh, yeah, it actually has like a pretty interesting parallel to the section of the phenomenology of spirit that I was reading this week. Here's our, here's our weekly Hegel update, but um, I'm towards the end of the chapter on reason, where he's talking a lot about ethics and um, yeah, like he kind of, he, he's going through like a variety of kind of like ethical systems and talking about how they're inadequate in various ways. Um, and he's especially focusing in on the Kantian system, the deontological kind of approach to ethics where, you know, like the categorical imperative kind of framework where, you know, you have an obligation to do whatever it is, whatever like ethical thing that you think people should do. Um, but Hegel's view is that um, that kind of absolutism is always inadequate. It's always going to become admired or enmeshed in some kind of uh, contradiction once you get down to the particularities. So, you know, Kant will say like, uh, you should not steal because of the categorical comparative. Like if everybody were to steal, then every, like everything would break down and like society would not be able to function. Therefore, nobody should ever steal. But then Hegel kind of like, first of all, questions the institution of property itself, which is a bit radical. Um, and then, you know, like there, there are plenty of particular situations that we can think of wherein somebody might be justified to steal and where, you know, such an absolute law doesn't really pertain very well. It's not, it's not really adequate to the particular situation. And, um, you know, it's ultimate conclusion. I mean, I can't say that it's ultimate conclusion. Like there's more to come in the phenomenology of spirit, but, um, what seems to come out of his treatment in the chapter on reason of these various ethical systems is that it is kind of impossible to escape contradiction when you move from thought to action. Um, so he's, he's really talking a lot about action and, um, you know, how action is kind of going to eventually like get you caught up in some kind of quandary but you can't escape from that it is constitutive of action um so how does that relate to what we're reading uh well i guess i guess the idea here is that uh you know the critical theorists were um not really doing enough action um they're a bit afraid like adorno in particular is very afraid of action because of you know it's alleged totalitarianism but uh yeah whatever that that does seem to be a big theme of like the 1960s in terms of philosophy like i haven't actually read too much derrida but like my understanding is that seems to be his whole 
project is like, I don't know, like kind of calling into question any ability to like be sure of any sort of meaning in anything. And that seems like an extremely postmodern position to take where it's like, you know, like you're questioning what words even mean and like how you're basing like your associations of things. And like, it's the kind of philosophy where like maybe if you had started reading philosophy for answers, you're gonna basically get the opposite of that where it's like, this is not only raising more questions, it's like raising questions that are like making my life more difficult to move forward in any meaningful direction rather than just like exciting me and compelling me to explore. Um, so like we, you could get into like why that was the case. Personally, I think it might've been like the CIA. Um, <laughs> the CIA was behind it. But like this did seem to be a theme in the 60s where there was a lot of like questioning and breaking down of structures without like the production of like a new way forward. And the difficulty of that is like the way in which these structures were like being broken down was valid. Like. I'm sure if you read Derrida's critique of language and meaning and things like that, he probably does set out like a logical like structure where you're like, okay, I, I get why you're making that argument and I can see how there's validity to this. And I think like, I have not read Hegel, but I like what you just said. Like, I like this idea that when you take action in any direction, like you're inevitably going to get caught up in contradiction. And it's the same with like any sort of like moral system that you try to implement into the world. Like you're inevitably going to be able to think of a situation that could take place in the real world that's going to like contradict shit or that like, you know, would break like the moral structure, but would still be seen as a valid action. And I think like recognizing this, this sort of ambiguity and inevitable contradiction of anything that you do, how like things can only really be perfect when they're still in like the theoretical realm, still in like the realm of potentiality of thought and not of actuality. Like I think recognizing that like any sort of actual action like will entail contradictions and eventually like reach its limits is like a good way of recognizing that and then like still taking action because like if you don't embrace that you're just gonna like you know you're gonna end up like the frankfurt school just sort of endlessly questioning and theorizing and like never being able to propose a way forward like i think it's basically like you know this is fundamentally it's like the progressive conservative like dichotomy where like the conservative wants to stick to like some sort of established moral code some sort of structure some sort of set of rules and they want to say like, okay, let's like act as if these rules were true for all time, like eternally, like they were handed down by the gods. They're like the perfect system that can like work forever. And the conservatives like motivation for doing this is that like, if you act as if that were the case, it kind of like frees you up from all of this ambiguity and questioning and like self doubt. And you might be able to run a stable society for a very long time with that kind of belief set. Whereas like the basic, progressive mindset is that okay well there's going to be these contradictions inevitably in any sort of like moral system that we have so maybe we should try to like figure out what those contradictions are address them like come up with like new more complex systems that better handle like all of these like nuances and potentialities of life and there's like valid there's validity in that too because inevitably you're going to come up against those like complexities and you know you're going to want like a way to move forward with them the downside of it, of course, is that like the more time you spend trying to figure things out, the less time you're spending actually doing anything. So I think there is like a balance to be struck between this like endlessly questioning, endlessly like trying to figure out more and more layers of complexity. But at a certain point, you also need to be like, okay, we need to move forward as if we did know what we were doing. Yeah. <clears throat> Ultimately, the only way forward is through, through meaning dialectically via determinant negation, via Aufheben, sublation. The only way forward is, you know, by um, like figuring out these contradictions and then figuring out how to overcome them and, uh, you know, continue moving forward. But um, yeah, like one of the things that you said, uh, like Adorno, for example, is... Um, I think we actually read in an announced essay from volume two, um, they're talking about how like Adorno in particular is kind of like 
a bit well known or a bit like infamous for um, being very pessimistic in his view of uh, like the potential for the proletarian to do anything for any kind of like um, social class to be able to you know emancipate itself like he you know you you can see that in his theories of the culture industry and whatnot like he, he's kind of like known to be a bit of a pessimistic a bit of a defeatist kind of thinker and kind of like where he does have some hope of some kind of emancipation or revolution it seems to be like fairly spontaneous or something um <clears throat> And then in the conclusion of this essay, like their critique, I, I'm not going to read it because it, it's pretty like pithy. Basically, they just say that the critical theorists, meaning like the Frankfurt School, the people who actually like coined the term critical theorists and applied it to themselves, uh, were too much about thinking and not enough about acting. And like the, the idea of a communist theory is to yeah, strike a balance between the two. But um, to bring this back to Hegel a bit, like another thing that he says in the chapter on reason, and this is a bit of a, you know, just citation to authority. I can't really give like a, like a very concise and like coherent, like summary of his argument or whatever. But like his, one of the points that he wants to emphasize is that um, <clears throat> like your, your thought is not really like people are constituted by their actions, not by their intentions. What really counts is actuality, meaning like um, your execution of an intention. Um, you know, like we can see this very easily in the example of like an artwork, for example, like no matter what your intention, no matter what your ambition for like some piece of work that doesn't count. It doesn't matter because it doesn't exist for another. It, it only, you know, exists, uh, I don't know, inside your head in some kind of way. Um, it, it is not being actualized. It doesn't really count. So in the same way, like in ethical terms, um, the only thing that really counts is your action like that is what people are constituted by it is their actions and not no individual is constituted by any particular action but you know they're constituted by like the sum of their actions or something so um <clears throat> i guess the idea that i was trying to uh make here like the parallel that i was trying to draw is that um you know, you have to, to some extent, like be involved in action. And like, if you're a critical theorist and you're like very busy thinking and like critiquing and, you know, diagnosing, um, <clears throat> but these diagnoses don't have any kind of like a productive application, um, then it doesn't really count for much. You know, it's, it's pure intentionality and uh, there's not much actuality there. Um, to try to like relate this to communization theory more generally, it seems like, uh, I mean, from what we have read so far from EndNotes, which is, you know, just, just one um, segment of the, the overall current, um, one of the points that really seems to be a cornerstone of communization theory is this idea that the proletariat uh, is not is no longer like the revolutionary subject that like you know the workers identity is no longer sufficient to you know do a revolution it's not it's not good enough like people don't really identify it with it enough in order for it to yeah you know, be able to like unite all sectors of like a heavily atomized uh, population. Um, which seems very much drawn from critical theory. I mean, it, it, yeah, it really seems to owe like a pretty heavy debt to Adorno and his 
you know, ideas of the culture industry. Adorno is like the critical theorist that I've read the most of, but seems to be like a pretty classical kind of a critical theory kind of idea, even like drawing a little bit from like post Frankfurt school, people like Guy Debord, for example, seems pretty relevant to that whole society, the spectacle thing. So there seems to be like this, this pretty like, um, there's this continuity between the Frankfurt school and communization theory. Um, but I guess where the Frankfurt school kind of became um, a bit pessimistic, at least, you know, again, represented by Mr. Theodore Adorno, um, kind of became a bit pessimistic, maybe you could say reactionary because they didn't have like a real political program in some sense. They kind of uh, were anti-political programs, but didn't like, I don't know, didn't stop substitute it with anything. So kind of basically in a sense, like supporting the status quo. Um, communization theory seems to be like taking up that idea, but then trying to overcome it and trying to, you know, move forward with it um, so that, you know, they're, they're replacing this idea that, uh, you know, the worker's identity is not sufficient to organize a mass movement capable of overcoming capitalism with an idea, with some kind of identity that is. Like, it, like from our reading so far, it seems to be a bit open, it seems to be still ambiguous what communization theory actually advocates for. It seems like there are still like a lot of, I don't know, like open-ended questions. Like there are not things that are resolved, like whether or not communization theory turns out to be like a valid um, form of critique even, or, or like a valid like theoretical current is still TBD just because they haven't like reached the end of it. I don't know if you could really mm -hmm. reach the end of anything, but ultimately if, if like EndNotes continues to such a point in like volume 10, where they say that like, there's no hope of revolution, then we have to abandon communization theory, no matter how well that conclusion is argued for, because then you might as well kill yourself. Because if, if that is where your theory leads you, then it is not a theory that you can hang on to because, I mean, this is my view as a communist because like you have to be optimistic. You ha if, if you don't have like a, a, a reason to um, think about a revolution, to hope for a revolution, some idea about how that revolution is going to happen, then there's no point in living or whatever. There's no point doing it like you've basically admitted defeat so it's not it's no longer a good theory that we should hold on to um yeah. so like it seems like communization theory at least as represented by endnotes is still working towards whatever their conclusion is um whatever they're going to replace the idea of a worker's identity with and um yeah like where that winds up <laughs> who knows but uh mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I mean, just to comment like on what you just said about theory, like one thing in my personal experience is like, I always try to be aware of like where a theory ultimately leads to, like what its goal seems to be. And like, I'm fine with theories being open-ended and having like an indeterminate goal. Like what I'm more concerned with is like when there is a clear goal, but it's not somewhere I want to go to, like for instance, if I were to read like an anti-natalist theory or something like that, like a really like pessimistic nihilistic view of life where it's like, oh, you should never have been born. Like, you know, life isn't worth living. Like, and I'm gonna give you this really well-designed theory that's like really like well thought out and articulated that's gonna make you like not wanna be alive. Like, you know, like Schopenhauer or something. Like I'll read it, but I'll like always have in the back of my mind, like, okay, like, it doesn't really matter how well reasoned this is like I know that like where it wants to take me is like kind of the opposite direction of like what I want out of life like I feel like I already have like an internal moral sense or like intuitive sense of like what I want to move towards and like I'm willing to like concede that the path to get there is like 
indeterminate, like like all sorts of twists and turns. But like I can kind of feel when a theory is like just leading me to like pessimism and like self-destructive tendencies and like I won't get on board with it just because it's like well articulated. Um, yeah, so where do you feel that uh, communization theory is leading you? Well, I was about to say, like, I do feel like, uh, I was just thinking about this, like a theme of pretty much all of the contemporary political theories, like actual, like new theories, not just like the continuity of like neoliberalism or like trying to like dig something like fascism up from the grave and like reinstitute it for a new generation like actual like new developments in theorization, like communization theory, the various like accelerationist theory and a lot of even like the neo reactionary and kind of like, you know, like alternative right movements that you see these days, like new developments in theory, they all feel kind of like stepping stones where it feels like none of them really have a clear proposal of like the exact steps that they want to like instantiate to like change the social like they might have like aesthetic ideas of what it's going to look like. But it feels like they're all taking the form of like an open ended questioning where they're realizing that we're in kind of like this strange new territory where none of the major ideologies of the 20th century quite 100% map to the current conditions because like we've entered this like extremely globalized order in which there's like the threat of environmental catastrophe. Uh, atomization has progressed to a really advanced degree. Like, so the conditions are different. And I feel like what all of the new theorists are doing in like the 2010s and maybe even like the 2000s and probably ongoing for a while is asking questions, trying to get a better sense of like what actually is happening and what the trajectory is. And none of them have actually reached the point of having like a clearly implementable like process and it's almost like an arms race in some ways where I feel like all of these divergent theories are all attempting to be the one that gets like the clearest sense of place first so that it can be implemented. Um, but yeah, I do get a real sense of ambiguity from all of the theories of the present day. Like I think like a big difference, like if we're going to compare like communization theory to like the critical theory of the 1960s, like if we look at the difference between the 60s and today at least in like north america like what the difference is because like the critical theorists saw in the 60s they saw a lot of the like conditions of the present day emerging like this increasing like commodification and atomization but it was still on like this very abstract level where you kind of had to be like you know a pessimistic intellectual who was kind of like an outsider in society to like see it clearly I think for like the average person in say the United States in the 60s it was very easy to buy into like the myth like you know it would have been like an exciting time to be alive like you would have gone to school for a few years and then got like a career that would kept you busy you would have got married at a young age bought your big house in the suburbs and like started having kids and like you'd be having barbecues with the neighbors and watching tv every night and like there was just like a lot of distractions like culture at least superficially was extremely vibrant there was like a lot of stuff to keep you emotionally busy well into old age the case today is much different i think for a person in their 20s and 30s especially like there is this feeling of culture being kind of in decay like uh you know like for basically my whole 20s i've been hearing news stories about like how millennials aren't getting married they aren't getting real careers they aren't buying houses they aren't buying cars they aren't making plans for the future they aren't saving money they aren't taking trips they aren't buying diamond rings they aren't watching like tv shows they're just kind of like hanging out and i think like in large part that's because that feels like it's the only thing really available like there's this feeling that you've been kind of cast into this world where there isn't really like a narrative. There isn't really like a framing device anymore beyond just like the hustle, beyond just like trying to get by, trying to, you know, find a job that doesn't suck, save up enough money that you can kind of like work on your hobbies and maybe you can kind of casually date a bit and like, you know, maybe there's some TV shows you like, but like it all feels like very unengaging. So I think like the, the nihilism and dissatisfaction with culture that was like kind of very like very concealed in the 60s that would have only been visible to someone like Adorno who had his ear to the ground is now like a commonly felt reality where I feel like the majority or perhaps like just a sizable minority of like youth culture and like you know maybe even people up to their mid 40s like Gen X 
are very well aware of the problems inherent and like are very on board with the idea of like, you know, some sort of large social change of some sort. So I think there's just in general, a lot more interest in these like open-ended kind of critical questioning theories, even if they don't provide clear answers, because there's just like a general feeling that something needs to change. Right, there's a general feeling that something needs to change among the youths, but I don't really see that reflected in um, these generations participation in uh, like political, I don't know, groups or any kind of like political reality that could make such a change, I suppose, because, you know, as the communizers would have us believe, all of those sorts of groups, meaning, you know, union organizations, things like the DSA, or I don't know, the NDP, not really, um, or, uh, you know, like whatever it is, tenant unions, all these sorts of, um, you know, organizations that um, could potentially um, be a means to challenge or change social reality, people are not really like flocking to them in great numbers. Like youth, I'm sure that there are far more young people today who oppose capitalism and recognize its insufficiencies um, than there are involved in any kind of organization that is ostensibly about changing capitalism or overcoming capitalism. I mean, the youths are out in the streets in protests when that sort of movement emerges, but they're not, um, you know, participate, they're not all joining the DSA. I, I suppose the idea is, again, as the communizers, communizers would have us believe that those sorts of organizations are still based around the idea of a worker's identity and are therefore inadequate. And the people know that they're inadequate, which is why that they, they are not participating in them. And um, the reason that they are participating in these kind of like spontaneous collective types of movements, such as, you know, massive protests across the entire nation um, is because like that is where there is the possibility of kind of like spontaneously uh, developing a new form of political consciousness or organization that is, you know, still capable of overcoming social reality, but which is not, you know, tethered to this inadequate, antiquated idea of a worker's identity. I don't know. Yeah, that is a good thing to point out. Like, I do feel like the political activism such as it exists amongst like our generation and younger is like of a very informal nature where like you say, like you'll see a lot of things like the protest waves of 2020 will be very like widely attended or even like, you know, when like all of those protesters stormed the Capitol in January like you'll see these more sort of informal shows of dissatisfaction, but you won't see people joining unions or any sort of organized thing. And like, I think another manifestation of this is with the internet and the availability of resources, you'll have a lot of people who are interested in politics and they'll go like really far reading like what previously would have been extremely obscure, like political theories. And like, they'll be investigating like ideological forms that are extremely niche that like it almost seems like they're like taking on this ideology because it is niche because it is some sort of like extremely complex like movement that's like very far removed from the conventional like liberal conservative dichotomy uh there almost does seem to be this like protest against like any of the organized forms of the past even the ones that ostensibly would seem to be in your interest, like these like workers to union type of movements. Like it almost feels like there's this like semi-conscious or unconscious rejection 
of any like previous generations like organizing formula in favor of this like very individualistic and like emotionally fueled kind of like re-territorialization of like everything that existed before like when I look at like contemporary political discourse it very much just feels like people are like picking and choosing little bits and pieces from like all of these wildly divergent ideologies of the 19th and 20th century and maybe even like older more archaic ones and like kind of like trying to reconfigure them into a form that actually like elicits like some degree of excitement like more than anything else that seems to be what people are reaching for is something that actually invigorates them to take action because like for whatever reason like if we get into the psychology of it it does not seem like the idea of starting a union actually inspires a lot of people for better or worse yeah on on this uh this topic of um you know, political movements and whatnot. I thought that uh, there was one interesting, pretty like well articulated phrase from this text to bring it back to the text, um, where they spoke about how, you know, in previous epochs of struggle, um, you know, in in like Russia, for example, like the the movement began in the factory and then spilled out into the rest of society. Whereas today, the challenge is for a movement that begins in the streets to enter into the factory, into the site of production. I thought that was like a very, uh, like just good way of articulating it because like the reason that all of these movements that, you know, continue, that are so persistent, like they're constantly these big fucking struggles going on everywhere all the time basically um but the reason that they don't really end up doing anything is because they stay in the streets they stay at this kind of ultimately symbolic political level they cannot actually enter into the capitalist cycle and exert pressure at the real levers of power there's not been like a like meaningful like wildcat strike for example in who knows how long there's not been any kind of like union organized like um you know work stoppage or anything like that in who knows how long like all of these movements in the streets like the people go back to their jobs afterwards or whatever like maybe they loot a target or something, but like that is, that's a write-off for target. Like they're not really, um, you know, like hurting the powers that be where they're capable of being hurt. They're not hitting the powers that be where it hurts. Um, so I thought that was pretty interesting, you know, turn of phrase. And it, it really like, you know, calls your attention to the fact that any kind of like political movement in order for it to, you know, be meaningful, it, it needs to enter into the site of production, which means that it needs to um, at once, like it's going to begin in the street and it's going to, as, as such, it is going to be composed of all a wide diversity of people, like the types of people who get involved in a kind of like militant street protest are very diverse you know you got a lot of the youths you got a lot of like immigrants a lot of people like involved on the basis of many intersecting types of um oppression and whatnot but from there it needs to still be able to appeal to the workers identity like it needs to not just a, a real like movement that is capable of challenging capital and potentially changing society needs to, you know, originate from the bottom strata. It needs to, you know, originate from the wretched of the earth and be composed of all these diverse types of people. But at the same time, it needs to be able to appeal to everyone meaning workers as well even though you know as the communists would constantly remind us worker identity is not adequate to like you know be constitutive of such a movement 
Yeah, oh. this is like, I think this is one of the realities of like automization or and global globalization, like that the balance of power has shifted and basically control of production becomes increasingly consolidated to an increasingly small number of actors. We're like, let's say like a hundred years ago, if you wanted to like form a union, like for one, like your focus would have probably been just on like a national level or like a provincial level rather than like a global level. And because most people then are like a significantly higher number of people were like trained factory workers who actually would have like you know, each individual would have played an important role in a factory because they were trained and had skills. Like you would have needed relatively less people to go on strike or to organize in order to affect some sort of change. Like if like a percentage of factory workers in like a given region were all to go on strike, this would basically halt production and would sort of force the people with like, you know, power to like address the concerns of the masses. You wouldn't even need a very large mass of people. Like, I don't know how many, but like, it would have been significantly less to, than today where like today the reality is, is that like, for one, the process has become so much more automated that you don't actually need like that many people to keep society running. Like most people's jobs are kind of superfluous when you come right down to it. They're like, you know, it's like, nice to have someone in the restaurant who brings your food over to you but it's not like you need it to keep industrial society afloat like the actual number of people that like run the machines that like you know maintain the farms and build the cars and stuff is like an increasingly smaller amount and beyond that like because we now live in this like global society if you are someone in like what is called like a high DD gdp nation and you go on strike like there's a strong likelihood that they can just outsource your job to a lower GDP nation where there's going to be someone who can be trained just as well to you as you, but is willing to work for like significantly less remuneration. So I think the reality is now is that in order to affect like change and actually sort of like hit them where it hurts, the people with power, you would need like a much greater percentage of the population to actually actively go on strike and in a much more like direct fashion like so if you had the same number of people striking now as you did 100 years ago it wouldn't make as much of a difference because you can like we're increasingly building a society where more and more people can just be like dissatisfied and out of work and even like actively revolting against the system and the system will just keep trucking which is why you have the development of movements like the 99 percent where like it feels like at this point in order to actually like successfully strike in a way that actually affects some sort of change, you would need like 99% of the population to get on board. Maybe not quite that much, but like significantly more than you would have needed in like the early 20th century because the material conditions have changed. Yeah, that may be true. My, my thought is that, you know, <clears throat> Um, it, it is like the left communist perspective that, you know, in order to do a revolution, like capitalism is a global system. All of these different nations are tied together. So in order to really successfully be able to do a real communist revolution, you need to do a revolution everywhere at once. And, you know, with regards to um, like logistics, for example, or like uh, outsourcing, just like globalization in, of labor and production in general. I don't necessarily know if you would need like a larger percentage. Maybe I think inevitably you would have a larger percentage who would like be participating in a kind of like whatever theoretical fucking pie in the sky, you know, whatever the hell we're talking about, like whatever strike we're talking about. Um, but I think this is an opportunity to, you know, organize people internationally since um, capital is already organized internationally in order to effectively strike, you would need um, your strikers to be participating in synchronicity, you know, across international borders and, then you wouldn't necessarily need like such a larger proportion of people to, you know, get on board. You would just need like um, 
to shut down or like halt the production line, you know, across its entire breadth. You know, you'd need, you just need like people participating from different countries who are basically working the same jobs to all go on strike at the same time in order to, you know, really effectively shut down production or whatever. Anyway, let's move on to, uh, I want to like talk about these actual the three concluding points that they bring up in their, in the concluding section here. So I'll just read the first one. The primary task of theory is to examine class struggle, not merely as possessing a theoretical framework, but as itself theoretically productive. Workers today face the problem of figuring out how to extend and intensify their self-organization and struggle in the absence of a shared class project. The paths that action will take are not knowable in advance. They have to be creatively constructed as necessary preconditions for the re-emergence of a communist movement. Theory should therefore seek to give retrospective accounts of concrete struggles of what they did, as well as of how participants in struggles understood what they were doing. The point here is not to cheerlead struggles, but rather to read them, focusing on how they confront the composition problems and the composition problem and attempt to solve it via the haphazard construction of new categories, new tactics, and new organizational forms, which resonate across society. What do these struggles in coming up against their limits tell us about the shape of the communist movement to come? End quote. So yeah, I thought that was a really great uh, paragraph. I wholeheartedly agree. I think it is very important here. And I think it, it um, really resonates with what so much of Ennote's essays are about, which are kind of um, like summaries or uh you know reporting on various struggles like in this issue four we read about uh ferguson as well as the um riots in eastern europe in bosnia and herzegovina um in volume three we read about the massive riot wave across the uh, uk as well as um we read a bit about Occupy in the essay on logistics and uh, you know the occupation of the Oakland ports. Uh, essay two, our, our volume two was like pretty theoretical. I don't know if there was much reporting. I guess there, there was some references to Occupy because that was coming more on the heels of the 2008 collapse. But yeah, I feel like um, from essay three or from volume three onward, they've really, um, taken this idea to heart that you know a lot of what they should be doing is uh like reading quote these movements that are happening and trying to like analyze them and see what is being put forward i think this is a very a very materialist position a very like good communist um position or like idea that they're suggesting here which is not which is that theory needs to arise from like praxis so like unlike you know a derrida or just like some i don't know derrida is like my go-to for like a completely idealistic kind of theorist like theory does not arise from just thinking about things like that is not that is that is idealism that is not where you get theory theory comes from action it is like essentially um action is productive of theory i think that's a very good way of thinking about it and it's also like a it fits in well with you know the scientific view of of uh, marxism where um <clears throat> you know if you're doing like a, a chemistry experiment or something the theory comes after the experiment um so it's it's like the empirical um data needs to come first in order for there to be a theory the empirical experiment is productive of the theory i don't know yeah this does seem like a uh, 
like writing about ongoing or recent events or even like rewriting about stuff you have written about previously does feel like a good middle ground where on the one hand if you're just engaged in like pure theory at a certain point you're like kind of just like endlessly recycling the same abstractions and going further down rabbit holes without getting any closer to an actual path forward and on the other hand if you're just like purely involved in like acting out in the moment like going to protests and like holding signs and like throwing rocks through windows and things like that like you know like you can get emotionally moved from event to re to event without necessarily noticing bigger patterns at play or like having all of the realizations that you could have so i think like when you engage with life and with practice in this way where like you're going out actually taking actions in the real world but then you're reflecting on it you're meditating on it you're reviewing it that's actually useful because you can actually test something out and then kind of discern patterns which might not necessarily have been obvious during the protest in itself when like emotions were running high you didn't have access to all of the information that would have been available from like you know a detached viewpoint so i think it is very important just on like a personal level but also on like a, a political level to be doing analysis of like the events taking place so yeah i definitely agree with this point being made here um and point number two i'll read it here the second task of theory is to examine the forms of the unfolding crisis of capitalist social relations which provide the framework or context within which struggle takes place. We have argued that the breakdown of the capital labor relation occurs in and through the generation of surplus populations alongside surplus capital. In examining the process of this breakdown, we must look not just for potential new proletarian unities, but also at the divisions within the proletariat that capitalist social relations both create and sustain along lines, for example, of race, gender, nation, citizenship status, education level, and economic sector. What accounts for the structural reproduction of these intra-class divisions, which are not merely epiphenomenal to a shared class interest? In an era of economic stagnation, divisions among workers have become all the more intense since, in the context of worsening labor market conditions, Many workers with better than average wages and working conditions strive to protect their corners of the labor market, not only from the onslaughts of capitalist austerity, but also from other proletarians. Reading this, I'm just struck that like these three points here are really just like a justification of EndNotes' whole thing, like everything that they're doing. This is basically covering every type of essay that they published. They published like kind of like, um, you know, these summary, summary analyses of contemporary, you know, workers or, you know, proletarian struggles. And they also publish these like kind of like cutting edge or like, you know, newfangled kind of like uh, analyses of the capitalists production process like their whole thing is based on these kind of um newer um analyses coming out of you know the neue marx lecture like the value form theory as well as this whole thing about um surplus populations is really key to their whole shtick and also like formal and real subsumption they have all these new kind of like they're not really new because they're all derived from Marx all contained in his writings but they're kind of like overshadowed I mean they have these whole like arguments about how like Engels mistranslation of Marx caused like the value form theory for example to be kind of overshadowed throughout the entire like first half of the 20th century and is only really with like the disciples of Adorno in the Neue Marx lecture that these new ideas kind of like came forward and uh, were developed and, you know, they are like particularly apt to describing contemporary capitalist social relations. I mean, this is a good example of where like the sort of abstract theorization by groups like the Frankfurt School actually is useful 
because when you're dealing with like a really complex phenomenon, like, you know, the capitalist labor relation and things like that, the case may be that it might've been around for like many, like basically a century by the, like the 1960s, like Marx had written his work back in like the middle of the 19th century. Um, and there could be these like very like nuanced and abstracted points that people had been consistently overlooking for decades that spoke to things that wouldn't on the surface appear to be directly mediated by capital. Like there's end notes, essays about like race relations and gender relations and stuff that at first glance would seem to be very far removed from capitalism. But then you actually read like these theories and you see how it's all like caught up in the logic of capitalism. Like all of our social relation, relations are mediated by capital. And like, it's important to do this kind of analysis, even if it feels at first, like it's on a very like high plane of abstraction and not tied to like the real material conditions because the real material conditions are actually informed by these abstractions. Like it's important to come to recognize how much your own worldview, your sense of like directionality, your desires, like your orientation in space is mediated by capital. Because if you don't become aware of those things, you're just inevitably going to continue reproducing the labor relation, even if you think you're fighting against it. Yeah, I think what what is, um, I guess, important for me in this point is that um, you kind of have to, like, they're basically saying that you have to be, like, attuned to how social conditions are changing um, in order to you know, be uh, like, and on top of your analysis of how capitalism works. So like, you might, you might think that like, um, you might study like social relations at the beginning or in the first half of the 20th century, because there is so much literature that pertains to that era. And you might think, okay, so now I'm like, well versed in how capitalism works and I've got it all figured out and I don't have to like I can now I don't know like diagnose contemporary phenomena or whatever um or I, I don't have to like study any further because like I've read all this classic literature or whatever but I guess their their point is that like um you know capitalism is the moving contradiction and it has moved through various uh, phases it's moved through various epochs or like regimes, if you want, um, you know, we're in a different, we're in a totally different, like, structure than they were at the beginning of the 20th century. It's like a completely different system, pretty much. Um, so a lot of that stuff from that period is not necessarily going to pertain to the contemporary period. And yeah, you, I guess you just need to like, I mean, and, and even in order to be able to like do a kind of relation in order to like understand what is new or like different or emergent in the contemporary, you need to have like a historical context that you can like compare it to. You need to like have some kind of um, uh, like idea that provides like a standard against which you know these new phenomena can be compared to in order to understand them as new as emergent as like um relevant to the contemporary so i guess yeah this point is basically like uh, pay attention to how now is different from before All right, so let's move on to the third point here. Um, the third task of theory is to gesture towards a communist future, a task which has become much more difficult after the end of the labor movement. The end of that movement was coincident with the evacuation of the emancipatory content of the categories of the capitalist world. Communism cannot be merely a reconstellation of those categories. The worker, the machine, and the factory, according to a new logic, i.e. the socialization of the means of production. Or to say the same thing another way, 
capitalist technology is not neutral, nor is the infrastructure that makes the use of that technology possible. Suburban divisions, electrical grids connected to coal-fired power plants, the material organization of social life today fits humanity into specific social grooves from which it must escape. How would an emancipated humanity use technology and design infrastructure? Without going into specific detail, it may nevertheless be possible to derive some principles of communist action in advance. A communist future would have to sever the connection between how much and what work one does and what one receives from the social store in a way that does not generate new structural forms of domination, whether personal or impersonal. Yeah, this really is making me think of the logistics essay in my conversation with Jasper Burns. I'm just going to read a footnote here. Automation will play a role in communization to be sure but it is difficult to imagine what that role will be in care work. Will we become mere living appendages to intelligent machines, tending to our young and old, our distraught, our lovers and our gardens, or is the labor of care fundamental to our humanity? Damn. Yeah, so I guess, yeah, this, this is about, uh, I, I feel like we have seen a bit less of this in EndNote so far. Again, like the logistics essay, it's very much about this. There's a lot of like, and as also um, the other essay that Jasper Burns wrote explicitly about agriculture that was not a part of EndNotes, but which uh, we discussed in my interview with him. You can go back and check that out. Um, yeah, it's very much about imagining a future. I know that in EndNotes 5, there's more, there's more in this. I kind of like flipped through it a little bit. And there's one essay that is like, I almost read like a, like fiction, like a kind of fantasy fiction set in like a communist uh, zone or whatever. And they're kind of like figuring things out and like thinking about how problems would be solved and what kind of problems would arise and all that sort of thing. Yeah, that's like, that is a very interesting topic to me, but I kind of get like why there is perhaps like limited discussion because it is so open-ended like when you start like moving beyond these questions of like okay how are we going to overcome the current like predicament that we're in like at least those have like a clear material object complicated as it may be to like assess like when you start looking at a potential future you really get into like more like kind of like open-ended philosophical questions like well i mean i guess there are still some material questions like all right how much what labor do we actually need to keep like the world running? But then you start to think like, okay, well, like what does a human being actually need? Like, what do we want? Like, you know, how do we deal with like the reality of like environmental change and balance that with our own like desires? Like how much do we like become the caretakers of the planet or else just try to like integrate ourselves into the planet? Um, how do we deal with like the different drives that people have? like? you know, people, what do we do about, like, the human desire for power and domination? Like, how do you treat that? Like, what, what do you do in a communist society? Because those, like, personality traits just don't magically go away. Like, you're still going to have people who want to, like, rule over things, and they want to, like, violently overthrow the system and seize power for themselves. Like, how do you deal with that without just instantiating a new control apparatus? And, like, how do you... And I guess one of the basic problems of liberalism is like it's ostensibly the society in which like you're trying to promote like absolute freedom for an individual to pursue their desires, but then you immediately recognize that like so many of those desires in their pursuit would involve like, you know, um, subjugation of others or perhaps the in even just the inconvenience of others. So how do you create like something that is balanced that people actually feel is like worthwhile to inhabit? And that's like, those are difficult questions. I don't, I don't know if you can actually just like answer those. It feels like something that you just kind of like keep negotiating with over time, over like a changing set of circumstances, perhaps forever. Who knows? Like, yeah, I mean, there's, very, yeah. 
there's the famous line that uh, from Marx that like you don't want to I don't know be writing recipes for the cook shop of the future, but like what they're saying here is not writing recipes, but like uh, you're coming up with principles. So yeah, not necessarily I don't know too tied to like um, particularities, but you know thinking about how I don't know things would be dealt with in general in some kind of general sense like the question of um whether or not we want to automate care seems like a pretty valid question to ask personally i think that we would not want to automate care it seems like that would be something that we would say is essential to our humanity that we would not want to sacrifice but um i don't know maybe maybe other people think otherwise we certainly need to socialize care in some sense so that it is not so tied to like one uh, gender identity, but yeah. Anyway, I think, I think it is um, yeah, a good idea to think about what a communist future would be. I think it is like, a, you know, important for our contemporary comrades. Like it, it can be very, um, inspiring and kind of hopeful there's like a long kind of tradition of this sort of thing in like speculative fiction for example um but like i'm actually quite excited just thinking forward to this uh and notes five essay where i know that they they deal with this like i'm excited to read that because like i feel like it it would feel good to mm. imagine myself being in a communist future and like living the kind of ideal life that we would you know be living that that would the ideal life of of the human being you know and like trying to like think about what challenges you know you would be presented with and how you would overcome them it feels like very satisfying and um i don't know i feel it seems like it would feel good to read that sort of thing yeah i think i mean i think there certainly is a place for optimism like a person can kind of get caught up in this like really dense analytic work and like just constantly be addressing like the problems of the present day and like the potential like problems of the future and like all of the things that went wrong in past attempts at revolution and you know just get really caught up in all of these sort of like dark heavy complex kind of like areas of focus and they can be like wary of being overly optimistic because there's this association of like optimism with escapism where you're kind of just like going into this like dopaminergic like fantasy zone where you're like thinking about like things that don't actually exist and you're not actually taking action but i think like optimism is perfectly justified when you're speculating about a future that you're actually trying to move towards or something that like feels like it's in the general direction when it isn't just pure like escapist fantasy when you're actually remembering like ultimately like what you're trying to bring about like what you're actually trying to do it isn't just like anger and frustration at the current order it's also like hope for something different you know and i think you know it's good to remind yourself of those things from time to time yeah, absolutely optimism is a political task like every communist needs to be optimistic about the future otherwise you're not really fighting for anything you're not fighting for communism optimism is absolutely political it's really key and essential and it is not in any way mere escapism i mean I, like escapism is not really optimistic to me like it is presenting an alternate reality um that you can go to in order to escape the present oppressive reality it does not really reflect the possibilities of the present or like the trajectories of the present or anything like that it's not optimistic it's like pure fantasy like optimism or, or fantasy is not necessarily optimistic it is just like something it's it, it most generously you could say that it's like neutral but um you know, optimistic speculation about the future or speculation about the future that is optimistic would, you know, speculate about a future in such a way that is, you know, contiguous with the present so that he could see that future being a part of the present. It is not mere, you know, escapist fantasy, but it has some bearing to, you know, present reality. 
Um, yeah. Anyway, so that's it. That's it for uh, what is this? Is it called crisis and immiseration? Something Critical theory like today. Um, thanks for joining us. We'll have another bonus episode next week. If you want to suggest a particular reading to us, then you can send me a message to get on our Discord, or you can you know go to our Patreon and support us at three or five dollars a month, and uh, you'll get access patreon.com forward slash the inverted form you can go there you know throw us a couple bucks if you want to support the show get on the patreon suggest a reading for us or yeah again just send me any kind of dm on any kind of platform and uh i'll most likely allow you i'll grant you access to the privileged zone um but uh yeah until then owen do you have any concluding words um I turned 30 this week. Oh wow. Everyone, Congratulations. Yeah, now I'm now I'm privy to all of the secret stuff they don't tell you in your 20s. You're officially a boomer. Welcome yeah, to the club. I'm officially a boomer. I'm gonna go get some of those like those like uh zero calorie white claw monster energy drinks. Nice. They're not actually zero them. calories. I think they're 110 calories. Uh, they sell them to you as being the healthier monster. They I mean that's a lower calorie than oh wait, monster? Are you talking about white yeah. claw? What like the the monster that's like white can with claw okay. on it? I call them white okay. claw. I don't know if that's no. like the official term. White claw is a separate thing. It's an alcoholic beverage. Oh it's shit! It's like it's all like that a time I thought I was getting like energized. Uh, drink a few white claws before hitting the gym so that I have caffeine. I was just getting drunk. Uh, well. <laughs> there you go. But see, now that I'm over thirty, they've explained this to me. Yeah, they meaning the kind the, of whiz the other, the other that you're year privy to. Uh, so yeah, for all you people in your 20s who are a little down on life, hold on. The day you turn 30, they're going to explain how all of this works. To you. Yeah, the day you turn 30, then you can start drinking. Yeah, and also like you're going to get a satisfying career. People will finally respect you. You'll be able to like sleep peacefully at night. Like yeah, I mean all of all of the stuff that your parents told you comes true at 30 this is officially a boomer podcast <laughs> that's cool well whatever yeah we're gonna just play acdc in the background and yeah nirvana um so if you want to if you want to chat with some boomers get on our discord otherwise uh you know happy birthday owen oh, uh pisces pisces brother here mm-hmm. um yeah. again we're putting out we're putting out auditions for like a third host to the cancer so the yeah cancer exactly if you're a cancer back. and you want to uh be a third mic we there's a, a water podcast so uh mm. exclusively cancers even though i don't have the greatest history with cancers but um yeah you gotta keep it the theme you know yeah stay on brand all right well until next time bye everybody bye